And now for today's final award, the National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal. The Public Welfare Medal is the highest award that the National Academy of Sciences confers on anyone. This year it's being awarded to John P. Holdren. From the H1N1 flu and Ebola outbreaks to the Deepwater Horizon explosion to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Dr. Holdren helped coordinate U.S. response. His long and distinguished career in science has included seminal research and policy engagement on fusion energy, causes and consequences of global environmental change, energy technology innovation to, make the to meet the climate challenge, and international security and arms control. The Public Welfare Medal dates from 1914 and is presented annually by the Council of the Academy in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science to public welfare. Dr. Holdren is being honored for his many years of work on behalf of science, particularly in his role as science advisor to former President Barack Obama from 2009 to 2017, making Holdren the longest serving presidential science advisor since World War II. Dr. Holdren holds the Teresa and John Heinz Research Professorship of Environmental Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and he's co-director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program in the school's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. During his time as director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, otherwise known as PCAST, Holdren was responsible for advising the President on all science and technology issues, including public health, energy, climate change, the oceans, the Arctic, the nation's space program, and national and homeland security. Holdren successfully advocated for federal budgets that prioritized basic and early stage applied research and pushed for increased free access to the findings of federally funded research. In addition, he worked to bolster science's role within the federal government. Following up on a 2009 presidential memorandum on scientific integrity, Holdren issued guidance subsequently adopted by some two dozen federal agencies that outlined standards for shielding science from political interference, prioritized the professional development of scientists and engineers, and enhanced the ability of federal advisory committees to provide independent scientific advice. Holdren earned his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering from MIT, and his PhD in Plasma Physics from Stanford University. He was one of the first recipients of the MacArthur Fellowships, and he has been awarded innumerable awards, including the Volvo Environment Prize, the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, the Heinz Prize for Public Policy, and seven honorary doctorates. Holdren is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Phil Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and the Council on Foreign Relations. He's also a former president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. As one of our most outstanding and effective public servants, John Holdren has more than fulfilled the call to restore, restore science to its rightful place as he was charged to by President Obama. If I can say personally, as someone who served in the Obama administration, John Holdren, by his words, his actions, and his presence, made us all proud to be scientists. We are thrilled to present him with our highest award. John, would you please take the podium? Well, thank you very much, Marsha, for that very gracious introduction. 
I thank also the Academy's Council uh, for selecting me for this award. Uh, I thank uh, my wife, Dr. Cheryl Holdren, for her unflagging support over 56 years of marriage. Uh, and I thank our extended family for their support represented here today by our niece, uh, Krista Eady, and her husband, Nick Lewis, sitting in the front row. Uh, they're the only members of the large Holdren extended family uh, able to come today, and I'm very grateful for their presence. I'm grateful also to President Obama, who I think was without question the best boss any science advisor to a president of the United States could have had. Uh, I also have to say that it's a particular pleasure for me to be presented with the Public Welfare Medal by the first woman to lead the National Academy of Sciences in more than 150 years. <clears throat> the honor of receiving this award is also amplified for me because so many of the previous recipients were my mentors, my colleagues, my friends, uh, those include Jerry Wiesner, David Hamburg, Gilbert White, Shirley Malcolm, Bill Fagey, Norm Newrider, Neil Lane, Jane Lubchenco, and last year's awardee, Tony Fauci. I learned from all of them. Uh, although I never met him, I also learned from the 1945 awardee, Vannevar Bush, who, as the head of the Office of Scientific Research and Development in Franklin D. Roosevelt's White House, uh, was really the first full-time science advisor to a president of the United States. His 1945 report, Science, the Endless Frontier, was famously the foundation, the blueprint, for creating a comprehensive U.S. federal science policy after World War II. I think it's no accident that all of these individuals were people who engaged extensively in speaking science to power. Of course, what all scientists do, expanding our understanding of the universe, our world, our society, ourselves, is a contribution to public welfare in the broadest and perhaps the most fundamental sense. But the Academy's Public Welfare Medal has been focused on the additional engagement with public welfare that's associated with getting down and dirty in the work of applying science to the public good. And that, of course, includes speaking science to power and speaking science to the public. Not least because I am currently writing a book tentatively entitled Speaking Science to Power, about my own experiences in advising government officials about science and technology over the years. That's mainly what I'm going to be talking about here today. And let me hasten to say that I mean science broadly to include the natural and social sciences, both fundamental and applied, together with engineering and medicine, as of course is reflected in the awardees of this Academy's Public Welfare Medal over the years. Importantly, the opportunities to speak science to power, and to an even greater extent, the opportunities to speak science to the public, are not by any means restricted to those who make such activities the dominant focus of their work. In fact, I think the interdependence of science and society is so important and so multifaceted that I wish everybody who does science would see it as a responsibility to spend at least a bit of their time engaging with government officials or the wider public to build understanding of how science works, what society needs from science, and what science needs from society. The vehicles for that kind of engagement range from op-eds and letters to the editor, to lectures for school kids and service organizations, to uh, engagement with uh, public uh, legislatures, with advisory panels, advisory bodies such as the National Science Board, the Defense Science Board, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, all of these are important opportunities to speak science to power and to speak science to the public. The need for those in power to hear from scientists was, of course, the reason that this academy was established in 1863. And meeting that need, 
remains a major function of the National Academy of Sciences and its sister academies of engineering and medicine today. My first opportunity to speak science directly to power at a high level was in 1970 as a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on International Environmental Programs. That committee was formed to advise Secretary of State William Rogers and his staff as they prepared formulating the U.S. stance for the 1972 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Stockholm. I ended up on that committee at age 26 through the intervention of the great geochemist and international scientific statesman Harrison Brown, who was then the foreign secretary of this academy. I had admired Harrison's ideas about science and society since reading his 1954 book, The Challenge of Man's Future. And you should understand it was 1954, otherwise he would have written The Challenge of the Human Future. Uh, I read that book when I was a junior in high school in 1959. And I read it together with C.P. Snow's book, The Two Cultures. And together, those books changed my thinking then and there about what I wanted to do ultimately with my professional life. When I then ended up sitting next to Harrison Brown in a small private meeting on environmental issues a decade later, the result was his offering me a job working with him at Caltech on issues of population, resources, and environment. After a couple of years doing plasma physics at the Livermore Lab, I did join Harrison at Caltech. He became one of my two most important mentors in making the transition to a career at the intersection of science, technology, and public policy. The other of those two key mentors was Stanford evolutionary biologist Paul Ehrlich, with whom I had started to work on population and environment issues in 1968, and who had dispatched me to the meeting where I met Harrison Brown. Harrison passed away in 1986. But Paul soldiers on and will celebrate his 90th birthday later this month. Uh, I'm sorry that he was not able to attend this year's annual meeting. Harrison, in addition to first connecting me to the activities of the National Academy of Sciences, was my entree to the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. From 1973 to 1997, the Pugwash Conferences were the venue for many of my opportunities to engage in international collaboration on nuclear arms control and nonproliferation and on energy and environment. It was at the 1973 Pugwash Conference in Aulanko, Finland, that I met George Kistiakowski. He was, like so many of my mentors, a member of this academy. He had served as a science advisor to President Eisenhower in the last year of President Eisenhower's term. And he was the first, Kisti was the first, to put into my head the idea that one of the highest aspirations in a career in science and public policy, aside from becoming president of this academy, would be to serve as science advisor to a president of the United States. But let me return for just a moment to my introduction in 1970 as the most junior member of the Academy's Committee on International Scientific Programs to the activities of this academy speaking science to power. That committee, the Committee on International Science, International Environmental Programs, included storied NAS members, including Gilbert White, Roger Revell, Reds Woolman, Tom Malone. I learned a lot from all of them during that committee's run from 1970 to 1975 and in the years that followed. As generally happens, service on one academy committee led to service on many more. And the resulting connections to leaders of science and engineering communities and in the government played a huge role in my own career at the science and public policy interface. Now, when I'm asked by young scientists, engineers, and physicians for advice about finding their way to roles speaking science to power, I tell them to miss no opportunity to meet, work with, and learn from more senior people who have succeeded at this. And I must say that good fortune in that respect was certainly what worked for me. And I tell those who ask that there is no better way 
to make those connections than to get onto a committee at the academies of science, engineering, and medicine. Those kinds of opportunities have only expanded since I started on that path half a century ago. As of last week, when Ken Fulton and his team were kind enough to look the numbers up for me, the combined academies had 548 committees in operation now, 548 committees and boards engaging a total of over 7,000 volunteers. This academy effort is a powerful machine, a powerful machine not only for developing and propagating insights at the science and technology interface, but also for ensuring a continuing supply of people skilled at doing that. I want to turn now to a few thoughts about what we should be saying when we have chances to speak science to power, or indeed to speak science to the public. First of all, let me say with some regret that waxing eloquent about the joy of doing science is probably not the best place to start, even if for many of us that's the most important reason that we do it. It's unfortunate, but stressing that point plays into the critique that scientists just want to be sure that society keeps paying them to have their fun. Instead, I think that all of us need to get better at talking about why science matters to everybody, why it matters for the economy, for good governance, for public health, for national security, for disaster preparedness and response, and for an environment and a climate that we and our descendants can live with. We also need to emphasize that fundamental research is valuable not just because it expands the horizons of human understanding, but because, as President Obama said when he addressed this academy in 2009, it's the seed corn from which future applied science, with all of its tangible benefits, will come. And we need to remind decision makers, perhaps above all, the U.S. Congress, that social science is part of science and an important part. That reality is reflected in the 1950 statute that created the National Science Foundation. It's reflected in the structure of our academy. And it's reflected in the structure of the increasing interdisciplinary teams across this country and around the world that are addressing the biggest challenges at the intersection of science and society, including pandemic response, climate change, limiting the danger of nuclear weapons, and many more. Attempts by some members of Congress to eliminate or drastically scale back the funding of social science at the NSF was one of the more dismaying examples of legislative perversity with which I had to deal when I was in the White House. Likewise dismaying was the conviction of many in the Congress, and this remains, unfortunately, the conviction of many in the Congress, that international collaboration in science is some combination of paid foreign vacations for scientists and a siphon through which U.S. scientific assets and defense and industrial secrets are hosed into the possession of our competitors and adversaries. We scientists need to be more energetic in pointing out that science talent is global, that this reality and the global character of many of the, challenge, the challenges themselves mean that collaboration is a necessity, not a favor that the United States does for others, and that the risks to our country from properly chosen and managed collaborative activities are modest compared to the benefits. Another misconception in the mind of many policymakers is that any scientific effort that fails is deplorable and reflects badly on the scientists involved and on the funders. We need to explain more emphatically that any suitably ambitious research or innovation portfolio is going to entail, necessarily will entail, some failures and that demonizing those failures and restricting funding to sure things is a prescription for confining science to incremental advances and giving up on the game-changing breakthroughs that high-risk 
high return research can bring. Silicon Valley's motto, fail early and often, is not a bad guide, really, for the most ambitious components of society's research and innovation efforts. The final point I want to make this afternoon on what we scientists need to be saying when we speak to power and to the public is that our country needs to be more generous and more innovative in strengthening science, technology, engineering, and math education, STEM education. President Obama liked to say that STEM education should be a project that extends from preschool to grad school to worker training to lifelong learning. And he liked to point out that we need to lift our game in STEM education for really three good reasons. Not only to inspire and train new generations of Nobel Prize winners and members of the National Academies and high-tech innovators to build our economy, improve our health, protect our environment, strengthen our defense, but also to train the tech-savvy workers that the jobs of the 21st century increasingly require, and not least, to educate the science-savvy citizenry that a democracy needs in an era when more and more of the decisions facing our elected leaders have science and technology components. With respect to a science-savvy citizenry, what is most important, I think, is not trying to cram our students and audiences with ever more scientific findings and facts, but rather to give them a better sense of why science matters and how it works. That means talking about all the ways that society has improved people's lives. It means talking about the cumulative and self-correcting character of science. It means talking about the bases for judging the credibility of assertions about what science says. That is, telling people why a report of the National Academies is a better guide to understanding than somebody's tweet or, tech or Facebook page. It also means talking about the nature of uncertainty, including that the inevitable presence of uncertainties is not the same thing as saying we don't know anything, and that uncertainties are usually but not always symmetric, meaning that when we learn more, our best estimate of the magnitude in question might go up or it might go down. Today, too many people seem to believe, for example, that uncertainties about some of the details of climate change mean that we are overestimating the danger and that when we learn more, the danger will be seen to be smaller. The reality is that we are more likely underestimating the danger from climate change in the light of the uncertainties that prevail that are probably not quite symmetric. To conclude about STEM education, Scientists need, when they speak to power and to the public, they need to talk about the crucial, the really critical need to enhance diversity and inclusion in STEM fields, inspiring more women and minorities to go into STEM and providing them with the tools and opportunities that they need to succeed there. President Obama was fond of saying, you can't win the game with half the players on the bench. We worked hard on diversity and inclusion in STEM in the Obama administration, including through the $2 billion Educate to Innovate initiative. That effort brought practicing female African-American and Hispanic scientists and engineers from companies, national labs, and universities into K through 12 classrooms to infuse kids with the belief that they too could have exciting, rewarding careers in STEM. I'm proud that our academy is flying the flag on this important issue, not least having just elected to a second term as our president, the immensely capable scientist, leader, and role model, Marsha McNutt. Thank you for your attention.